everyone. I am Shayma El Banna. I am the head of science at British Council Egypt. I'm really happy to be participating in the Arab Science Week. I am more happy and thrilled with uh, the person I am uh, inviting to speak to all of the audience of the Arab Science Week. I am thrilled to be with Jim El Khalili. Jim El Khalili OBE, he is a fellow of Royal Society. He is a theoretical physicist at University of Surrey where he holds a distinguished chair in physics as well as a university chair in the public engagement in science. His main research fields has been theoretical nuclear physics, though in recent years he has developed an interest in the new interdisciplinary area of quantum biology. He is also a well-known popular, popularizer of science, having written 14 books, between them translated into 26 languages. This is really impressive. He also a regular TV presenter, of TV science documentaries and host the long-running weekly BBC Radio 4 program, The Life Scientific. Now I'm going to leave the floor to Jim to talk to us for the next 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shema. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure, firstly, to be talking, uh, being invited by the British Council and to be giving this lecture uh, uh, on behalf of the British Council, but also to be speaking in, uh, during Arab Science Week. Uh, some of you may know that uh, I was born and raised in Iraq. So I I'll say it in Arabic first. I'm sure that in English, everyone Okay, thank you. Back to English now. Um, it's a pleasure to talk about this, this subject, and I'm now going to share my screen with you. I hope the technology all works. Good. I, I think you should be able to see the cover of my, my latest book, The World According to Physics. So I want to spend 20 minutes telling you a little bit about the contents of this book, uh, why I wrote it, uh, and why it's different from, from maybe other popular books on physics. I became inspired to study physics when I was still a boy, um, probably age 13 or so. So this was Mark. Um, I was in... in uh, uh, secondary school in uh, a place called Seddat al Hindiya, which is south of, of, uh, of Baghdad. Um, and I had a good physics teacher. And I think for many of us who, who, uh, who go into physics or into science or engineering, very often we do so because we are inspired by a teacher. And I fall in love with physics. Uh, and this book is really uh, my way of expressing my, my, my love for, for the subject. Now, there are many books on physics. There are many documentaries uh, or you'd see on TV, on YouTube, which describe the whole of physics and where we're at and what we understand and the history of the subject. I've written myself, I've written books on, on, on and made programs about the history of, of science in the, in the um, uh, Arab world and, and in, in the Islamic uh, empire. Uh, so, for example, my, my physicist isn't Einstein, it's Ibn al-Haytham. But this book is, is about where we are now, where we are today, what we understand about the nature of the universe, and also what we don't yet understand about the nature of the universe. So, if, if all our knowledge about reality is like an island and around the island is the great ocean of the unknown, this book explores the shoreline, the edge of the island, what we know and what is still yet to be discovered, what's still underwater. Now, um, about 40 years ago, so this was a, a, a paper written by Stephen Hawking in 1981, asking the question, is the end in sight for theoretical physics? So I'll even show you the, highlight the, the first paragraph. 
He says, in this article, to discuss the possibility that the goal of theoretical physics might be achieved in the not too distant future, say by the end of the century, so the, the end of the 20th century. By this, I mean that we might have a complete, consistent and unified theory of the physical interactions which describe all possible observations. What Stephen Hawking is saying here is he really felt optimistic that we will finally achieve and discover a theory of everything, a theory that describes all known in physics. Stephen Hawking was wrong because we haven't yet found that theory of everything. Physicists are working very hard trying to find, but we still feel we have a long way to go. If I think back to my career over physics, what is it that we have achieved? Maybe what, you know, what have we achieved since 1981? I, I started my uh, university uh, study in 1982, so a year after Stephen Hawking wrote this. Of course, there have been some exciting discoveries in physics. For, here's two examples. In 2012, Peter Higgs' uh, uh, prediction of the existing particle called the Higgs boson was discovered at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. Very exciting, big news, uh, uh, you know, everyone was talking about it. Of course, most people didn't understand what is this Higgs boson, but they knew it was something exciting about how our universe is, is, is made. Then a few years later was the discovery of gravitational waves. These had been predicted by Einstein and we've been looking for them for a very long time and finally they were discovered in, in, uh, in an experiment in, in, in America. Gravitational waves are actually waves in space itself. If you throw a stone in water and you see the waves on the surface of the water moving outwards, the ripples energy moving outwards on the surface of the water. Gravitational waves are ripples in space itself. Space stretches and squeezes, not because of a stone, but because in this case of black holes colliding together. An incredibly powerful event. Many, you know, many light years away from here, so far away that it took a billion years to, for the event to happen and the waves to reach the Earth. Again, very exciting. But the important thing is neither of these two discoveries was unexpected. Peter Higgs had predicted that he would find this, that this particle existed 50 years before it was discovered. Gravitational waves were predicted 100 years before they were discovered. So in a way, physics was expecting to find these things it would have been more surprising if we hadn't found them. In, in some sense, it would have been exciting if we hadn't found them, because that means we need to um, go back and, and think about our theories and maybe change them or come up with a new theory. The only really new discovery, certainly during my, my career as a physicist, was in 1998, and that was the, the discovery of something called dark energy. So here is my cartoon image of dark energy, borrowed from Star Wars, of course, the, the, uh, the mysterious force in the universe. Dark energy is a substance we understand. It's something that's causing the universe to grow and expand more quickly. We know it's happening. We know it's true because we can look at very distant galaxies and we see them moving away from us faster and faster and faster. Something is winning against gravity. If dark energy didn't exist, gravity would be slowing down the expansion of the universe since the Big Bang. Gravity would be pulling it, try to pull the universe together. Dark energy is working in the opposite direction. It's making space expand. Energy and show the still have mysteries in the universe that we need to solve. And this is good, this is exciting. I think life would be very boring if we had all the answers. But for a physicist, 
I want to understand those mysteries. I want to be able to explain them. Or certainly, <laughs> maybe I won't explain them or discover them, but someone else can and then they can tell. That would make me very happy. Where are we then in terms of finding Stephen Hawking's theory of everything? Well, in this cartoon, I, I represent the two leading contenders, the two uh, favorite possibilities for theory of everything as a, a, a struggle between two superheroes. On one side, you have string theory. String theory has been around since the 1980s. It's a very mathematical, very difficult, very abstract idea that unifies all the forces of nature. We don't know if it's true. We don't know if it's correct. We don't have experimental evidence to tell us to confirm that string theory is the correct theory of everything. On the other side, you have something called loop quantum gravity. Again, highly mathematical, I, I, I certainly, even if I had one or two or 10 hours, I wouldn't be able to explain it uh, in, in general language. In any case, I'm not an expert in loop quantum gravity or string theory. Loop quantum gravity, we don't yet know if it's the correct theory of everything. So you have a group of physicists working on string theory. You have another group working on loop quantum gravity. Each group wants their theory to be correct. But wanting a theory to be correct or believing it's correct is not good enough in science. We need evidence, we need data, we need proof, and we don't yet know. So how far are we from the end of physics? I don't know. Maybe we're 10 years away, maybe a hundred years, maybe a thousand years. Maybe we'll never find the theory of everything. Maybe we're just not clever enough. Of course, that does us from trying. It may be that there are fundamental issues about the nature of the universe that we still need to understand properly. So, for example, what is the nature of time? I remember thinking about this as a young boy before I had any of my education in physics. What does time mean? Is it something that progresses like a river thing? Is it static? Is it constant? And we, our consciousness moves through it. In my book, I explained that there are three fundamental theories in physics, three, what I call the pillars of physics, the pillars that hold up the whole, uh, the whole of physics. You have Einstein's theory of relativity, which describes the nature of space and time on the larger scales. It, it predicted the, the Big Bang. It predicts how the universe evolves, the nature of black holes, gravitational waves. Then you have quantum mechanics. That, this is the theory of the very small. This is the theory that I have my specialism in, that I do research in. It's a theory that describes the nature of atoms and the particles that make up atoms very successful, very powerful. Quantum mechanics we know is, 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 is correct because we've used quantum mechanics to develop modern technology. Without our understanding of quantum mechanics, I wouldn't be speaking to you now via this Zoom recorded lecture on my laptop because computing, modern, the whole of modern electronics relies on quantum mechanics being true. General relativity. Well, general relativity, if that wasn't true, we wouldn't be able to use GPS. On your smartphone, on your iPhone, when you, when you find, want to find out where you are, what's happening is that your phone is receiving signals from satellites in space to, to tell it where it is. Now, to do that, those satellites need to measure time very accurately. Einstein's theory of relativity says time flows at a different rate depending on the city. And satellites that are very high up feel slightly weaker gravity because they're further away from the center of the Earth. So time runs a little bit more quickly. So we have to use Einstein's theory of relativity to correct the clocks on the GPS satellites. If Einstein was wrong, your GPS would not work. This is 
in a sense, good proof that general relativity is correct. General relativity is correct, quantum mechanics correct. The third pillar is called thermodynamics, uh, and that talks about the nature of heat and energy uh, and other ideas, not at the very or the very large, but at the scale of everyday phenomena. The problem is that we have these three theories which we are very confident about, but we don't know how to combine them together to make a theory of everything. They're all very different. And my example here is even the nature of something fundamental like time is, is defined in different ways using these three theories. Gelibity says time is part of the physical fabric of the universe. It's a dimension that can be etched, squeezed by gravity. Time is a dimension. Quantum mechanics says, no, time is just a number. You put the time in your equation and you solve your equation like a machine and it gives you your answer in the future. You can even solve it backwards to give you an answer in the past. Time is just, just what we call a parameter. Then you have the thermodynamics. That says, no, time isn't a dimension, not a parameter. It's an arrow. It's a direction. Thermodynamics says that time only flows in one direction, from the past to the future, never back in the opposite direction. So even something as simple and basic about the nature of time, our three current best ideas in physics, each of which works perfectly well in its own domain, cannot agree on. There are many other things we, we still don't agree on. I just want to give you very quickly, as I come to an end, some popular ones. I get asked these questions all the time. What came before the Big Bang? You physicists, you are so clever. You say there was a Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. Why did it happen? What caused it? What came before? We used to think there was no real answer to that. If you walk to the South Pole and you reach the South Pole, try to keep walking south. You can't. You're at the furthest point south. Any direction from the South Pole takes you north again. So we say this is the same thing as the time of the Big Bang. There is no time before the Big Bang because that was the beginning of time in the same way that there is no south to the South Pole. But now physicists are saying, no, maybe, maybe there was a time before. Maybe our Big Bang wasn't the beginning of everything. Maybe it was just the beginning of our universe and there may be other universes. Um, there's an idea that physicists are now currently studying called inflation, which suggests that after the Big Bang, the universe expands very, very rapidly for a short period of time. We don't know if this is true or not, but it's useful. It's a useful idea because it explains some problems in astronomy that we see. We now have a new idea which says maybe there's inflation and then the Big Bang happened inside inflation. The Big Bang of our universe. Maybe there are many other universes in what we call the multiverse. So I'll leave you with this last image. Guess what? I like it. It has a picture of me. <laughs> this is this is from a book I, I, I wrote uh, on, on gravity, um, a small popular book in English. I think it only exists uh, in English at the moment. Uh, so this depicts this idea of the multiverse. Our universe may be one of an infinite number of bubbles in, in this multiverse. We don't know, again, if this is true. There are physicists who say, we believe this is the correct description of reality. But in physics, we can't say we believe something. We have to check it. We have to test it. We have to find evidence. I find this all very exciting because we know so much about the universe. We, we've developed so many wonderful technologies based on our understanding of physics, and yet there's still more we need to understand. Will we ever reach the end? Maybe not, but that doesn't stop us from trying. Thank you very much. Shukran Jazeelim.